the very first and the very last, perhaps ultimate, of the US Navy's propeller-driven fighter aircraft was supplied by the one company. These planes, for their time, represented the pinnacle of their technologies. In Flying Through Time this week, we'll look at the lineage and contemporaries of the plane that would win the Pacific War. Aircraft Company is the second oldest aircraft manufacturer after the Boeing Corporation. Founded in 1917, the company has been through many organizational changes and almost as many restructures and affiliations, all the while producing many outstanding aircraft. In 1922, the company founder, Chance Milton Vought's seventh design, the VE-7 two-seat advanced trainer, was commissioned by the US Navy. VE for Vought Experimental, 7 for the design number. The VE-7s were originally built in a disused stocking factory and were lowered to the street in pieces out of the windows. Though classed as a trainer, it was so well received by the Navy pilots at the time that it was ordered into mass production as a fighter. Several versions of the VE-7 found their way into the Navy's service, among the models were twin-seat observation planes and float planes, but it was the fighter version that was to establish the company's association with the U.S. Navy. On October 17, 1922, it was a VE-7 that took off for the first time from the decks of the U.S. Navy's original aircraft carrier, the Langley. This marked the long and at times daunting developmental phase of naval aviation. The requirements for naval aircraft are much more encompassing and demanding than those planes designed for land-based assignments. A pilot requires very good visibility and a tough plane to withstand carrier landings. Because the gap between a landing and a crashing is very narrow, pilots tend to slam their plane onto the deck trying to attain a hookup. Early on in the development of carrier aircraft, the Navy filmed many undercarriage failures. These films stand as a record of the problems that were overcome by the Vought engineers in their achievements of the VE-7 and its subsequent models. Many models after the VE-7 were submitted to the military, though none were taken up in the fighter role. During the 1920s and 30s, it was only the company's sales of other types of aircraft that kept the company afloat. One of the reconnaissance series of these aircraft was called the Corsair. Other successes for the company were the SB-2U Vindicator light bomber, the US Navy's first low-wing monoplane that featured retractable landing gear and folding wings for improved carrier storage. Another success was the OS-2U Kingfisher Navy Scout plane, which entered service in 1940. This plane was supplied in both the land-based and catapulted seaplane version. In February 1938, the US Navy published a proposal for a single-engine fighter. Vought's submission was the V-166, designed by their chief engineer, Rex Beisel. Beisel's concept was designed around the experimental XR-2800-4 version of the Pratt-Whitney double wasp radial engine. The two-stage supercharged R-2800 engine was the most powerful engine in the world in 1940, delivering an amazing 2,000 horsepower. The whole airframe was designed around this monster engine. To get the proposed performance from this massive engine, it required coupling to the huge Hamilton standard hydromatic propeller, which was 13 feet in diameter. This propeller was also on the cutting edge of design at the time. It was built from a cold stretched steel core and the blade skins were welded on with silver. The final product was produced to exacting results and the extremely high reliability that was required.
For carrier duty, the landing gear had to be very strong, so a short, stout leg was required. And with such a large propeller requiring extra deck clearance, some concept to accommodate both needed to be achieved. Vought engineers came up with the distinctive gullwing design, which became the trademark of the F4U Corsair. This bent wing design allowed the huge prop to clear the deck while providing the strength required in the landing gear. As a bonus, the wing also improved the airframe's aerodynamics where the wing attaches to the fuselage, boosting the overall top speed. This was not the first effective use of the bent wing design. The Junkers Stuka dive bomber also used this concept with great effectiveness. With its gull wings, the Stuka plummeted toward the ground at a true 90 degrees. From its level flight speed of 255 miles per hour, the Stuka accelerated to 335 miles per hour as it dived some 4,500 feet. It was this ability to make such a controlled vertical dive that enabled the Stuka to deliver heavy bombs with greater precision than any other aircraft of the European war. At the predetermined altitude, the pilot began the automatic pullout. This brought the Stuka back to level flight at 6G, descending another 1,475 feet in the process. In May of 1938, the Vought prototype, renamed the XF4U-1 Corsair, won the proposal against some excellent aircraft, one of which was Grumman's F4F3 version of the Wildcat, later to become the F6F Hellcat, which also switched to the R2800 engine during development. The new XF4U Corsair-1 became America's first 400-mile-an-hour fighter. The differences in the design philosophies between the extremely successful Hellcat and the Corsair One are best described by their design orientation. The Hellcat made some performance sacrifices to achieve safer carrier landings at slower speeds, whereas the Corsair was designed to be a carrier plane, but performance was its objective. Unfortunately, it was these questions over the Corsair's safety that led to it only being assigned to land-based operations initially. It was the units obtained by the British Fleet Air Arm that swayed the US Navy into re-evaluating and accepting the F4U for their carriers. The English had a long history with aircraft carriers and their opinions were well respected. Quickly, the British pilots came to truly appreciate the performance of their Corsairs. With some modification to the landing gear to reduce the bounce and the adoption of a curving approach on landing to maintain the pilot's visibility, the F4Us went into operation. One other modification was required removing four inches off each wing for storage so as to fit below decks on the small English escort carriers. The American Marines based at the newly acquired Henderson Field on Guadalcanal were having to fight stiff Japanese opposition to maintain their hold in the arena. It was only through their tactics and numbers that the Marines F4F Wildcats could better the unconquerable Japanese Zeros. With battle damage, the primitive conditions and an unfinished airstrip, Henderson Field was soon littered with damaged aircraft. The fighting went on here for five months. The Japanese eventually gave up Guadalcanal in January of 1943, though they were still deploying very large numbers elsewhere in the theater. On the 12th of February, the Marines received their first F4Us, and on the first day, most pilots logged over nine hours in action. The next day, they provided fighter escort for the bombers to Bougainville, 
to this point unheard of because of the range of the existing aircraft. Soon, marine pilots were to be heard to say that they were flying the best fighter planes in the world. To back this up, in one tour of duty on Guadalcanal, 68 Japanese planes were lost to only 11 Corsairs. Not only were the Corsairs excellent fighters, they were also used in close ground support as well as anti-shipping duties very effectively. With the arrival of the F-4U Corsair, the Japanese had lost their air superiority in the Pacific. From the British results and the enthusiastic reviews of the Marines in the Pacific, the US Navy began retesting the F-4U in April 1944, and they were eventually cleared for carrier service. This proved timely, as the Japanese war machine was now employing the desperate kamikaze operations, and the Corsair's power was sorely needed. course of the Pacific campaigns, the Corsairs maintained a loss ratio of over 11 to 1, an impressive legacy even by today's standards. The end of the war coincided with the crossroads in engine technologies. The new jet engines were in and propellers were old hat. War spending budgets were being cut, and in an odd twist to satisfy their lend-lease requirements on their planes, the English were forced to dump their F-4Us at sea. Comparing the planes of the day against the Phantom, the Corsair was only 30 miles an hour slower, but had almost twice the range and could carry significantly more load. As a mark of their abilities, the Marines and the Navy kept their F-4Us when most other models were simply scrapped. In English aircraft, this period also had a parallel development from their Hawker Typhoons and Tempests to their pinnacle, the Sea Furies. By the end of the war, most fighters had become bigger and more powerful. These Hawker models used both inline and rotary engines and became very powerful, formidable aircraft. The ultimate development of the line was to the Sea Fury, fitted with a Centaurus 15 rotary engine outputting 2,550 horsepower. The Sea Fury was an outstanding aircraft, a tough customer in the attack role, but with light and responsive controls and excellent performance. Interestingly, both the Sea Fury and the Corsair have proven to be favorites with aircraft restorers today. These Sea Furies were flown in Australia's island state of Tasmania in a recent air show and pylon race. The performance of these planes, even today, makes them an inspiring sight. Their classic shapes and throaty engines always draw large crowds in the hope of seeing a piece of classic aeronautic history. During the Korean War, there were a small number of reports of the two planes attacking MiG-15 jets. One was of eight MiGs trying to outturn four FB-11 Sea Furies and losing two jets to the propeller-driven plane's cannons. Two other MiGs were damaged, while the Sea Furies returned safely to their carrier.
While the F4U was built heavier to suit the thoughts of the time, the FB11s were actually a lighter version of their Typhoon and Tempest forebears. In Korea, the carrier attack squadrons of Corsairs and Douglas Sky Raiders were used very effectively in the area of close-in ground support and night interdiction missions. With their large load capability and very accurate close-in ground support, the Corsairs tied up most of the Chinese transport and supply needs. The combination of American aircraft and their carriers gave the US and their allies virtual air supremacy. The Marines' efforts in Korea shine with the merits of the Corsair. The planes handle the extremely basic conditions on the matted strips with ease. The cold, though, was another matter. With the weather this extreme, the planes simply froze up. Even the Chinese could do little when it was this cold. As a mark of their worth, during the first 10 months of the war, the Corsairs flew 82% of the close-in tactical support missions. One squadron flew over 1,100 missions in a month. Corsairs production ceased in December 1952 and by December 1954 all units in service were withdrawn to the reserves. The last Corsair, the 12,571st, was delivered in February 1953 and the last operational carrier landing of an F4U Corsair was made on the USS Valley Forge in 1956. Some other countries continued their use into the 1960s, but their days were obviously numbered and they were replaced by newer and faster jets as technology finally caught up with them. Vought by this time had also progressed into the jet age. Their first venture was the XF-6U Pirate, However, its performance, compared to those swept-wing, higher-powered configurations delivered by the competition, was found to be severely lacking. By the time the Pirate was ready to go into production, its successor, the XF-7U-1 Cutlass, had been flying for more than a year. The radical swept-wing, tailless F-7U Cutlass naval fighter first flew in 1948, and the first F-7U-3 debuted in December 1951. The Cutlass again suffered from the problem of being underpowered, though this is probably more a reflection of the state of development in jet engines of the day. Production was cut back in 1954, and it was withdrawn from service in 1957. In May of 1953, Vought, now a subsidiary division of United Aircraft, won the new day fighter contract over seven other competitors. The new fighter, the XF-8U-1 Crusader, flew supersonic on its maiden flight on March 25, 1955. Vought again used a new concept to take out the contest, the variable incidence wing. This new wing addressed the landing problems experienced by the Cutlass. On takeoff and landing, the XF-8U's wing could be pivoted up 7 degrees, allowing the wing to assume a higher angle of attack, thereby lowering the approach and takeoff speed. This also kept the fuselage level and provided the pilot with good visibility. In addition, the raised wing's centre section acted like an air brake, reducing landing speed further, allowing greater safety and control on landings. Today, the Crusader has a reputation that's hard to beat. It had outstanding maneuverability, excellent performance, and a very powerful attack. In 1956, the U.S. Navy again called for submissions on an all-weather interception fighter. 
This time, Vought's entry was the XF HU-3 Crusader III. During flight testing, this plane demonstrated speeds of Mach 2.2 and an altitude of nearly 90,000 feet. The Crusader III was never flown to its limits because of the windshield assembly limitations. It was thought that without the windshield limitations, it could have reached speeds as high as Mach 2.7 or 2.9 at 35,000 feet. Unfortunately for Vought, the inspiring McDonnell F-4 Phantom beat the plane in the contest. On February 11, 1964, Vought again won the proposal contract for a light attack plane to develop the subsonic A-7 Corsair II. It was developed from the supersonic XFHU but it was the first supersonic design adopted into a subsonic design. While the lineage from the FHU is unmistakable, the Corsair II was in fact a totally new plane. The A7 first flew on September 27, 1965, four weeks ahead of schedule, and was adopted by the Air Force and Navy. In April 1968, the American Marines received their first A-9Ds. These were the first U.S. Army subsonic fighters in 15 years. The A-9 Corsair IIs would fly for almost 20 years, and they were only replaced by F-18 Hornets in 1985. The last of 850 A7s were retired from the Navy's inventory following participation in 1991's Desert Storm combat operations. These were, for their time, the best light attack aircraft ever produced. Unfortunately, the A7 Corsair series was the last fighter aircraft wholly designed and produced by the company. The achievement over this time from the first carrier landings to the ultimate in propeller-driven fighters and into the jet age shows how the Vought company has earned the respect it has achieved over the years. That concludes this episode of Flying Through Time. Join us in the next edition as we cast our cameras over the great achievements in aviation history.